I've been ruined by uh, commercials and propaganda for Liberty Mutual because I see the word liberty and I think liberty bibbity. Liberty bibbity. Yes, every single time. Liberty bibbity. What a wonderful story from Elliot. Welcome back. This is Andy, and you're listening to the Poor Pearls Almanac. Today, we're talking about probably the most important botanist in history. The one, the only. Liberty. Liberty. Hi. Hi. Bailey. 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 Yay. It's the man who shares a name with my dog. L.H. Bailey. He's got two initials. We're L. starting H. it here. Bailey. That's how he's going down. All right. So this is going to be a two-parter because the man, the man did so much that every time I'm going to say something, you're going to be like, Oh, so that's where like he kind of stops having groundbreaking things happen. And then I'm like, well, and then the next year he did this other thing. And that's just like how his entire life went. The man was unstoppable, involved in a million things, probably neurospicy. He's an interesting dude. This episode, I'm hoping to get through like the early years of his life. And I think it'll help frame up like a lot of the stuff that's going to happen in the permanent agriculture movement. He was instrumental in botany, obviously, agriculture, horticulture, ecology, biology, breeding, basically everything. He was world renowned for so many different things. It's really hard to even wrap your head around it. Yeah. So going over some of the key points in the episode, it really did remind me of the Frame Hernandez episode because he just kept like striking gold. Like, I don't know if he knew he was doing it at the time, but as he was, you know, moseying through his life, his studies and all of his special interests, he seemed to just be hitting things on the head, like males, just driving them home. And we still, I mean, I we've come away with so much interesting facts about his life. Just the little bit of reading that I've done. Seriously. He's like the... Like, by the way, like, he's this, like, world-famous expert on this random thing on top of his regular shit. Yeah, it's it's a fun time, and it makes you definitely feel like you aren't a failure at all. So, yay! <laughs> I have accomplished nothing. <laughs> yeah, basically. And the funny thing is, bringing up a frame, is that Bailey designed the program at Cornell that he ended up going through. So, that's cool. Like, there's already <laughs> one crucial piece of him directing that career path. And he was a large reason of why a frame went there. Uh, again, speaking to like the way this just like goes through the entire history of permanent agriculture and agroecology. Uh, and that's going to keep coming up throughout the series is that we've got all these people that are like, hey, I studied this because of Bailey or went through this program that Bailey designed because he didn't just design that program at Cornell. He designed high school programs and things like that that are going to come up later, and I'm already, I haven't even been able to get into it. And I'm rambling, into just it. Yes. rambling. Let's let's jump in. So our, our good friend, Liberty Hyde Bailey, grew up on apple orchards in rural Michigan. He was the son of a Vermont farmer, also named Liberty Hyde Bailey, because why wouldn't you pass that name down? And his mother was a woman named Sarah Harrison. And uh, they were some of the first frontier people to take up residence uh, around the Lake Michigan area, specifically in an area called South Haven. Now, his father had traveled under the expectation that South Haven would be like a thriving town. Like that's how it was sold to him when he was buying this land and going out there or however that worked. But when he showed up there, it was just basically wilderness. The old switcheroo. So his parents were like OG colonists, right? They just bought up some land and... Some raw they, land. Yeah, no one was it. living there at all, and it was just theirs for the buying and the taking. And yes, then they there showed were no the, people. Right, never. Right, we all know history, and so they showed up, and they were just like, "What was his plan? Was he going to be a farmer, or what? What was his plan?" Yeah. So what we know about him is that he wanted to grow apples. That was his thing. While we don't know the specifics about his father, because he wasn't as big of a deal as his son turned out to be. We do know his father did become close with the indigenous people there, the Potawatomi, the Ottawa, and the Miami, who had inhabited the region for more than a century. Liberty Jr., as I'll call him for now, was born on March 15th, 1858, on the same homestead that was the first place that his parents moved when they went out to Michigan. Now, the family actually ended up moving away from that land for a little while, and while they were gone, the indigenous people started using it again. And uh, when they went back, his dad was like cool with it, basically. He wasn't like, oh, I got to 
shoot some indigenous people for being on my property. They had a really good relationship. He would fish and hunt and share the land with the indigenous people. And again, he started that apple orchard, which would eventually become fairly significant in like apple pomological history in Michigan. And some of those trees were actually even standing until the 1960s, but I don't believe any of them are still left. So his dad was like a super farmer guy too. Sort of. And I I think it's worth noting that his dad built a relationship with the folks using his land instead of fighting with them, which I think uh, really underscores what we are going to see with Bailey in his concept of like land ownership and plant ownership and stewardship as he grew up. Yeah, Matt, that was a toss up for the apple not falling far from the tree. I thought you Mm. were going to hit that one out of the park or whatever sports reference, but I mean, swing and a miss. True. Swing and a miss. I'll hold my hands up with that one. But uh, it sounds like Liberty Hyde Bailey grew up seeing that the white way wasn't the only right way. So he could play well with others. Yeah, he understood a lot of nuance that was lacking, especially especially then and not to the same extent, but still today. And in this, he, he developed a really big respect for the specialness of like the native landscape. And that's something that uh, we see in the way he thinks about landscape design and a bunch of other things, as we'll, we'll cover in a little bit. At this time, uh, when Bailey was born, the family went through some shit. So it wasn't like a great time for his family. Scarlet Fever took his oldest brother, Dana, and it also took his mother a year and a half. So in 1862, he was only four and a half years old, had basically little to no memories of his mother. One of the only things that really stood out to him as he got older was his, her love for her garden. That's a rough start. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. Scarlet fever. Ugh. Yeah. So he, he would continue to maintain his mother's garden after her death, and he kept the same plants growing basically as long as he was there. And um, supposedly he actually took some of the roots from the garden with him and replanted them when he moved away and went to school. His father's response was, you know, very 19th century. He just kind of was like, I got to go work and remarried another woman named Maria Bridges in 1863. So a year later. I mean, I love how quickly dudes got remarried in the past. Could you just imagine 17th century dating? You're speed dating, right? Because I don't know if they mm-hmm. did that. They had to get a bunch of dates in because they must have. People didn't stay out past like, uh, they didn't stay out past like sundown because they couldn't see anything. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> candles, sure. Elliot. Come they on. were at like a shitty yeah. bar and a bunch of like tables for two candles. Ding. I'm sure how that's how a bunch of them got me. Anyway, I mean, he has a bunch of kids, right? And he doesn't see them at all because he's working all the time. And is that like a selling point for dating in the 1700s? Like you don't have to have kids and die on childbirth because I already have a family. So like, let's just link up together and happy wife, happy life. You're happy. I'm happy. He's like women. Women is a placeholder. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how any of that worked. I I don't know. (laughs) I, I couldn't tell you, but it probably was not far off in this landscape, in this environment that Liberty Jr. would also start to work, uh, you know, with a lost mother, a new stepmother, a lost older brother. His dad clearly, like, in the equivalent of therapy of the 19th century, which is like, I'm going to hang out with my fucking apple trees. Mm. There's worse therapy. There is definitely worse therapy. And at 10, he actually began to top graph trees and basically learned by following his father around the orchard. Uh, He ended up getting so proficient at grafting that certain varieties of apple could only be found on the Bailey orchard, such as the what was called the surprise apple. Before he was even a teenager, he was often hired by local farmers to graft apples in their fields because no one else could do what he was doing in terms of that grafting work. Can you imagine being like a... A hardened old like Michigan farmer and being like, hey, that 11 year old is better at grafting trees than me. I'm going to pay him 10 cents to do all of them. Yeah, like as a parent of an eight, an eight year old child, the idea of like a 10 year old being proficient at something like that, like grafting, which is like takes a lot of like nuance. Uh, that's mm-hmm. just like, I, I can't even wrap my head around it. 
Yeah, Andy, do you remember when you were at school and I was 10? They wouldn't let me around any of the crafting materials because, let's be honest, they're all weapons in the wrong hands. I mean, yeah, I, I remember somebody getting stabbed in third grade. Yeah, that's why Thanks. you don't trust kids with sharp things. Yeah. Now, Bailey spent as much of his childhood as possible alone in the woods. He liked to capture animals and bring them home, which obviously his stepmom was not a fan of. And uh, his school teachers being like a rural school that was just basically like, hey, get out of your parents' hair and maybe learn how to read. Uh, they would basically be like, you know, you should follow your interests. And it became very evident when he was in school that he was like brilliant, like not just smart, but like brilliant. His father also tried to support his interests. And um, despite being like a very religious person, he tried to support liberty and like doing things that were not entirely acceptable in religious circles like he helped him get a copy of Char charles darwin's origin of species which like didn't go over great with the religious crowd at the time at 14 he found his first botany book and uh, again it started to like bring a lot of these things together that were his interests met his intellectual capacity helped him feel connected to his mother all these different things and by the time he was like 15, he was giving talks on grafting to apple farmers and was considered basically a master in his field. All right, now I'm mad at this guy because at 15, he was a more successful public speaker than I probably will be in at least another five years. Or me. Or me. A's all around here. Now, around when he was 19, Bailey left the small town and um, his father and stepmother supported him in going to the Agricultural College in Lansing. Now, before we can dive into the school and why it was a really special opportunity for him, we're going to take a quick break. Yeah, and I'm going to brush up on his failures so I can point those out too. This guy sounds too good. Too good. We got to take him down a peg. Howdy. Hello. Hang on. Let me, let me try that again. <clears throat> Hello, skeleton army. That's... Aggressive? Yeah. I'm Angel Luna. I'm Nash Flynn. Welcome to Death and Friends. We're two comedians with a podcast. It's very original of us. Quiet, you. It is a history tour about everyone's final destination. As an academic. Nerd. I have a PhD. I almost sort of have a, kind of have a PhD. Anyway, I've researched a lot of death history. And also, I'm here. We'll talk about ways we die, ways we get buried, and ways we get remembered. And we even make some friends along the way. Huh. Is it a comedy podcast about death? Or a death history podcast that's funny? We have no idea. Mm. Look, death can be tricky to talk about. And even though we're talking about it a lot. <laughs> Just please know, in fact, remember that you are loved, you matter, and if you don't want to be your own friend, we will happily be your friend. Put me in your top eight, baby. Join us! And listen to Death and Friends. Become a member of the Skeleton Army. Like right now. Do it. It's mandatory. Go on. Subscribe. Hit the button. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Did yep. you do it? Yes? Okay, good. Okay. Love you. Love you. Death and Friends Podcast. Available everywhere you listen to podcasts. Death? Now, Michigan's Agricultural College was funded in part by the Morrow Act, uh, which is uh, one of the key pieces in the development of the agricultural education system that expands things like land colleges and extension schools into what they are today. This was kind of that first step. We chatted a bit about this with that Ephraim Hernandez episode, but by the time Bailey had attended school, the program uh, had been in place. And um, Michigan Agricultural College had tens of thousands of acres available for things like experimental agricultural projects, which is where we're really going to see him shine. It was also here, at, uh, actually at his entrance examination, that he would meet who would be his future wife, Annette Smith. He attended school for three years, you know, nothing particularly important or significant yet to talk about. And at the end of his third year, he was having these really big health problems. He wasn't able to walk for long periods of time without passing out. After a, some kind of surgery, there's no documentation of what it was. He returned to school in 1882. So is that like, we don't know some kind of surgery or operation, or was it some weird like 19th century made up stuff about like, the four humors or something like what surgery like fixes that morphine and cocaine or were they doing he, like he just went on a fucking bender <laughs> they, had, they were doing like trepanation and stuff like drilling holes in people's heads to make them feel better back then yeah i have no idea i'm uh we don't know and uh my guess is it was probably psychological it was the leeching 
It was, yeah, I don't know. Don't, don't listen to me for any medical opinions, please. Please. Man, I wish I'd heard that disclaimer before I uh, grafted another finger on for uh, additional chicken catching. It's, it's turning green, so. <laughs> green like the earth. I mean, green is good. I, not a green thumb, but green finger. <laughs> A green it's, uh it's not good it's not good. findex the fake index <laughs> yeah yeah he's got the green findex you know what i mean it's my ai distraction tool <laughs> now and now uh before finishing school as he was described by his professors quote-unquote young genius wrote an editorial in the college speculum of which he was the first editor-in-chief because obviously uh, and he wrote that, in quote, the farmers of today know nothing of the drudgery which characterized his profession a hundred years ago. This change has been wrought by no other force than the systematic and scientific efforts of educated leaders. The principles of science that underlie the, their labors will be applied vigorously. If every county in the North had within its limits one businesslike graduate of some scientific institution, and he a farmer, there would be just so many centers of power for the development of agricultural industry, end quote. So this guy, he's saying this generation has it easy? That's quite the optimism. And this optimism was actually like a constant thread in all of Bailey's work. Everything he talks about is we're just on the precipice. We're doing these great things. The future is bright. The future is now. Yeah, basically. During his senior year, he also organized with other students to establish one of the first college quarterly journals in agriculture. That's the one we just cited above, the College Speculum, which is just doesn't sound like I want to read it. Sure. Not the best name. I'll, I'll take it there. You wanted to knock him down a peg. That's the one to knock him down on. Strike one, Bailey. Yeah. He ended up being a chief editor for several journals and magazines throughout his life, this being the first. And uh, I think it really highlights the fact that he was interested in science and research and breeding and farming and horticulture. He also really loved to write, and he understood that he had to make what was happening in places like colleges accessible to farmers, and something like magazines was one of the easiest ways to address this issue. So he started a zine. I feel like this dude probably would have loved podcasts if he knew what the hell the podcast was. Oh, imagine all the great content we would have had if they had started a, a few hundred years earlier. Oh, and, my God. And he could have a whole... Our guest list would be amazing. That's what I was going to say. You just come on once a week and we could talk about freaking anything, apparently. So, yeah, what are you doing today? What's up, Bales? <laughs> Delay. Like LH. Yeah, he'd, he'd stop re returning your calls immediately. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Dude wanted me to sit in front of a wax cylinder. <laughs> I don't even. No, no. Um. So after graduating, Bailey returned home, and uh, he went back to work on the farm and didn't really have a plan. He he took a writing job for a, a local magazine called the Springfield Monitor, and he was actually promoted to city editor. You know the typical thing that happens to a twenty-something year old. But just as he accepted this job, he also received a letter from Dr. William James Beale, who was one of his former professors who had transferred to Harvard. And he basically was like, hey, listen, I need help doing work, uh, like botanical work, with um, a man named Asa Gray, who is at the time considered the most important botanist of the 19th century. Uh, and still today, I guess. Now, Bailey, obviously, you, you don't say no to that offer. He took it and he moved to Cambridge only a few months later in 1883. Having moved across the country away from those he cared about, he decided to write to Annette's father, James Smith, asking for her hand in marriage. They ended up getting married very shortly later, June 6, 1883, and she joined him in Boston. So basically, he graduated and then began his career working for like the michael jordan of botany yeah basically like i don't even know who to like compare that to today yeah i don't know now within a few short years bailey being the brilliant person that he was was promoted to assistant curator of the harvard university herbarium and while he was there he oversaw the students and garden herbariums at harvard when the Gray Herbarium work was completed, Bailey continued to work in Boston. And at the time, 
the reason why he wanted to stay was because it was still considered the uh, leading American horticultural center of the time, which makes sense because if you've been here, like there's a lot of cool stuff from that time, from Mount Auburn Cemetery to the Arnold Arboretum, which that Arboretum had only opened a decade earlier in 1872. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff happening in this area. 1872, also when F.H. King graduated from the normal school, for those keeping track last week. And I want to bring it up again because I love the normal school. How do you not? It's so it's regular. So it's normal. So... Uh, King was, he was the guy studying birds in like 18, early 1880s, right? Yeah. And um, he was actually finishing up his or- ornithology research at Cornell, which is where Bailey would be like a decade later. Sorry, spoiler alert. Well, now I'm not even going to listen to the rest of this episode. And neither I mean, you should shouldn't. you, listener. No, don't. Turn this off right now. While Bailey was at the Arboretum, Gray pushed Bailey to really reconsider and say, listen, you, you don't belong on a farm. You belong in botany and horticulture. Bailey, being the optimist that he was, was like, no, I want all of these things to, you know, there's no reason why agriculture is not paired with botany and horticulture. These things all belong together. They're related. And it was actually a few years later, he'd get the opportunity to try to make that case. So after being in Harvard for a few years, he uh, was offered the position of superintendent of the horticultural department at Michigan State Agricultural College. Uh, He was only 27 years old in 1885, and he was basically in charge of the horticultural program at the biggest state university, like, west of New York. So, NBD. Yeah, just just that little thing. Elliot, what were you doing at 27? Um, drugs? Yes, I was going to say drugs, but usually in a walk-in in a kitchen somewhere because I worked uh, double shifts for most of my tw- late 20s in kitchens. So yeah, drugs in a walk-in in a kitchen somewhere in America. <laughs> well... Hashtag freedom. We only know that Liberty Hyde Bailey wasn't doing the same because of the absence of walk-ins. He could have been doing all those other parts. On top of everything else, yes. On top, he could have been doing drugs in a kitchen. He could. I'm just saying. We, we, we can't disprove it. <laughs> you the most start. important thing. Somehow he was doing them better than me, which I find hard to believe. <laughs> but Liberty Hyde <laughs> Bailey, you're smoked too hard. <laughs> <laughs> no one could outsmoke Snoop except for one man. <laughs> Your research too thoughtful. They'll kill you, Liberty Height. Bailey. Um uh. Oh Jesus. <laughs> All right. So yeah, you were bring saying... it back, Matt. Come on. Okay, we gotta re we gotta recenter. Okay, so you said he would propose like this like new horticulture. And so for people that aren't like don't have an exact definition for like horticulture, we're talking about like plant management not specifically for like mass production or like domesticated food horticulture typically includes like domestic plants but not scaled to a food system so like more gardening flowers that sort of stuff exactly bailey wasn't like really out to try to change like grain production although he did grow some grain. I won't lie, because of it course was just he did. One it was of the things ca- he did. It was casual grain. It wasn't mm-hmm. like his his main thing. Now, what's going to become pretty obvious is that once he has tools at his disposal, he basically applies them in like a million different research areas at the same time. And frankly, like reading the things he was doing, it's even hard to track it as a reader. Which like it should be much easier for us than the dude that like has to dedicate lots of time to all these things, and unsurprisingly, because of his brilliance, he became like the nation's foremost expert on all of the things he got involved with. It's fascinating. He's really one of those Renaissance men. You wonder what it would be like if they had access to modern technology to support their research, or like what kind of whiskey this guy could have made with like his secret recipe grains. Yeah, like giving Da Vinci AI, like what he would accomplish, or like the nuclear technology to like power anything. I mean, hell yeah. Like, first of all, I would watch that Netflix movie of alternate alternate history. That sounds awesome. <laughs> that would that would be dope. Yeah. And Radioactive Mona Lisa, Ooh. it's the name of my new punk album. It's an hell album yeah. about, you know, going back to my roots, but with the knowledge that I have now, it's pretty reflective. Sounds like it. It's real deep. 
as long as your tits are like lit up. That's how you know it's really deep. Uh, now headlights, Andy. Headlights. <laughs> it's like radium girls. Yeah. Uh, hex girls kind of shit. Get that reference? No. Okay. Fine. That's hex fine. girl. Weren't they the band in Scooby Doo? They were the band in Scooby Doo. Good job, Matt. Oh, specifically, he's, he's where here. are you, Scooby Doo? Specifically, the 2002 Where Are You, Scooby Doo? What was it? Where are you? Oh no! What's new, Scooby Doo? No, they were. Yeah. What's new, Scooby Doo? Ah. Uh, okay. You throw me off, Matt. You're gonna make me look bad on Scooby Doo. Come on. Uh, it was. Oh my god, I don't even know. Oh, we we can circle back to it. No, now I need to know. Oh, they're from originally from the 1999 film. Wow, they have their own Wikipedia page. Like that says something about a society that makes a Wikipedia page for the band and a show that like no one cares about. Ex- Excuse me, you don't care about what's new Scooby Doo airing first in two thousand two for three sorry. seasons. This they originally showed up in Scooby Doo and the Witch's Ghost in nineteen ninety nine. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then they showed up again in Scooby Doo and the Legend of the Vampire. And uh, they were also in What's New Scooby Doo, and then Scooby Doo Mystery Inc. So they they really have a catalog. And so tying this back to Liberty Hyde Bailey, Liberty, 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 Liberty. All right. <clears throat> so my point was that like Bailey was the face of the change that's taking place in horticulture, botany, agriculture. He was the man that everyone cared about. And like obviously it's a small category like group of people that cared, but like also a lot more people farmed back then, so it was a much bigger deal. He was looking at the work of like Darwin and Gray and like other people that are talking about these ideas of like complex systems and evolution, and then like trying to take these ideas and applying them to fields that had otherwise been kind of static and like didn't really have like a these kind of complex ideas behind them. So they offered some new ways to consider like how plants evolve or plants existed and ex- like with the landscape and with other things on the landscape, how to deal with changes and immediate problems about like what was going on with crops. Why were they being eaten by bugs that didn't do it 20 years ago? Like how do we deal with these and understand what pests and pathogens were affecting their plants and how thing ideas like evolution would help them understand how to deal with that. So basically what ended up happening is the fields of botany and horticulture basically were fundamentally reshaped over a few decades, basically. And Bailey was one of the key figures in trying to like navigate these new rules of how science operated in these fields. Yeah, so I guess take note, boomers. I don't think they listen to this fucking show, do they? I think we need more stickers. Boomer stickers? Yeah, that could be fun. More bumper stickers. Yeah. I mean, at 27, I'll be lucky if I can have, like, a rent lease in my name. Never mind a whole horticultural program. Womp womp. <laughs> this episode's sad. 27, I had a collection of big lighters. Mm. Mm, at 27, I had... Did I have any kids? I did have a... I might have had a kid. I think I did. Yeah, I had a kid. You I had a kid at 27. You don't even remember. You don't even remember your 20s, No, it was a blur. Andy. No, I don't. So his first year taking over this program, basically he spent all of his time restoring the orchards, um, installing gardens, building grape vineyards, getting everything kind of in the way he wanted it to be done. And then his goal was to begin the process of documenting the plants across their lifespan from... Things like average germination rates to what periods of the plant's life cycle did they grow fastest to uh, specific characteristics of leaves and flowers. So basically, Bailey understood that there was no exact record of the whole biography of a plant. And he wanted to create that because how do you understand a plant if you don't understand all of, all of its parts in its life cycle? While botany had been given labs to do tests and analysis of plants for like cataloging the horticultural program where he managed things, they weren't lucky to have those, those things. And, um, Bailey decided that he was going to fill that void. He was going to basically treat horticulture the way botany had always historically been, been treated. And that would eventually fundamentally change horticulture's relationship to botany and agriculture. So this wasn't even his main shtick. Like he's revolutionizing horticulture 
pretty much as a side quest because why not really, right? L.H. Bailey's the main character. We're just the NPCs. We're just living in his world. He's still the main character. He's been dead for like 70 years. Mm-hmm. Well, it's got to have a, um epilogue. Yeah, it's a long one, but you know, mm-hmm. I'm still doing it. <laughs> Continuous epilogue. Yeah. And the fact, again, this is just one area that speaks to how he got involved in like everything. Part of what he was trying to do was provide an economic framework for horticulture in order to move it into those other fields like agriculture. And one of his other interests that we haven't talked about yet is landscaping. So while he was interested in uh, improving the farm industry through better understanding things like annual vegetable crops, and eventually then being able to leverage the research and documentation that he was doing for breeding. He was also really interested in this idea that he wanted to improve rural living itself. And that meant not just economically, but aesthetically. This is where like a lot of native plants became really important to him. He was very interested in native plants as a landscape feature. Uh, And he said, and this is a quote from him, many wild plants, especially some of the shrubs, are worthy of cultivation in the dooryard. Some of our attractive swamp shrubs thrive on any garden soil. One never appreciates the beauty of many common plants until he sees well-grown specimens in the garden. So he was casually like, hey, on top of everything else, let's just begin developing ornamental varieties of like native plants we have next to no botanical knowledge of. Yeah, basically. Is that on our list? The list. It was on Bailey's list. Now, unsurprisingly, when he he's one of those folks that just everything like works for him, all of his programs grew. He had all these experimental fruit pl- plots that were planted out. He started, like I said, got into experimental grains. He had new greenhouses erected, and uh, they started working with tropical and subtropical plants. I'm guessing this guy... Probably has a medicine or something named after him, like an aspirin pill. Hmm. Surprisingly, no, I don't think so. He should. He literally, look, he took barley, right, as one of the grains. And he was like, you know what? I've got time to improve this too. And I'm going to do some 17th century science here. So he's like, barley sounds like Bailey, but Bailey sounds better. Therefore, I make barley better. That was like an archer sentence right there. Did I do it? How was the enunciation? Perfect. NBD. You you and Bailey got this. That's my take on 17th century science. And as far as we know, that could be true. We, we don't science. know. Science. We just don't know. Ultimately, we don't. None of this even matters. Bailey's fixation on native plants wasn't just on their beauty, but their potential to be used as food crops. So, bum, 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 we got more interests. Ooh. Special interest time. So he advocated, like, developing breeding work for wild gooseberries, the cultivars wild goose and minor, which were native Chickasaw plums, sand cherries, wild crab apples, pecan, uh, pecans, and all other native nuts, pointing out that, and I quote, there are no less than 25 fruits of various kinds, natives of Michigan, which present attractive problems to all lovers of botany and horticulture. The horticultural department desires to undertake the solution of a few of these problems. Our present method must be to plant the seeds of the finest wild fruits and await results. We desire the cooperation of the students and others in securing seeds of the largest, smoothest, and sweetest of all kinds of native fruits. Okay, so let's add native crop domestication to the list on top of fixing grains, bringing back native ornamentals, backyard garden crops, and writing about all of these specimens. And it was at this time that Bailey refined his idea on what he called the new horticulture. And he outlined this in a lecture titled The Garden Fence. In it, he advocates bringing science into the fields themselves and to see experiments run by both scientists or scientific people and what he called practical men. This concept didn't apply to the research of science, but to the distribution of it to farmers themselves. Bailey argued that for better education of both farmers and youth, Working to put materials together that could be then applied in rural schools would teach future farmers fundamentals about agricultural science and botany without it being like a lecture. Bailey basically argued that his goal wasn't to make farmers think like him, but rather to help future farmers see, investigate, and think for themselves. And part of the challenge that he started to realize as he was developing these types of programs, and as we'll see in the school that he develops where Russell Lord goes 50 years later, 
the lack of universal nomenclature and structure around things like plant identification made it really difficult to be able to teach fundamentals to people without a botanical not without like extensive botanical knowledge. I think you guys know where this is going. We're just adding to his list. I mean, I'm exhausted for him if he's thinking about going into administration and education. Yeah, let's take a quick break and see where this goes. Hey there, it's Andy from the Corporal's Almanac. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to our podcast. As you can probably tell, this content involves extensive research and editing to release weekly episodes. If you think this content is valuable for the future that we inherit, please consider financially supporting this project by visiting poorproles.com and clicking on the Patreon, Venmo, Ko-Fi, or PayPal tabs. Every dollar helps offset our costs for hosting the podcast content and helps offset hundreds of hours of work put towards this project monthly. Thank you for supporting us by sharing, liking, and donating to this project. Together, we can build a better future. So if it wasn't clear already, Bailey was a champion of many of the fundamentals around agriculture and botany as we see them today. From all the crops we just talked about to the fact that he was like, we need to have a better structure for how we categorize plants and science to many of the things we haven't even gotten to, plus the fact that he was 27 and had this huge position as like of power in horticulture at that young age. He also was one of the first major proponents to write about and advocate for research around acclimatization, which is this idea that plants could learn to adapt to new climactic conditions, which is basically what the Soviets tried to do uh, with their citrus program, which we talked about on our Patreon like three years ago. So if you're not familiar with the Soviet citrus program, really interesting subject, hop on our Patreon, scroll way the frig back. Yeah, man. Trench lemons. It's not yeah, just a, trench lemons. That's all Elliot remembers. It's not just slang from World War One. Yeah. <laughs> Now, in 1887, Bailey urged scientists that, in quote, we need to study our plants in the fields rather than in the herbarium to acquaint ourselves with their entire history and their habits, end quote. Now, this was also included with studying plants in their native habitats as well. So again, you you already see like ideas that are still even kind of new today being presented 150 years ago. Like, if you were to talk about that today, you sound like you're a very cutting-edge ecologist. But, like, he, he was saying this 150 years ago. He also advocated that domesticated plants could handle climates there while its counterparts could not, spoke to the fact that through selective breeding, you could do a lot of really interesting stuff with plants, which at the time was really poorly understood. This was one of the things that drove Bailey into doing a lot of research around hybridization, which at the time wasn't considered a scientific field and was just something that farmers did because they didn't know any better, basically. So much of like what we eat and what we grow, like plants, animals, like a huge amount of it relies on hybridization. And you're saying that this was like kind of uh, something that was used by farmers, but like ignored by the academics of the time. Yeah, basically, it was just kind of like, oh, well, it's just letting nature take its course and you happen to pick the best plan. It wasn't understood as like a something that you could control mm. or at least like be, be on the, like, the basics. And we've talked about that, too, how different regions, especially in uh, America, as country as big as America is, you would think different regions would have different foods. But that hybridization has kind of flattened that out where, you know, red meat that you buy at the store in Massachusetts can be the same as the meat that I buy down here in Georgia now. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah, and, so, and like, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, um, one of his main goals when he was getting out of college and getting into work, you said he wanted to bring science to the farmers and bring the farmers into the science too. So it sounds like he's back on track and sort of main questing again, if that's one of his big goals on his list, right? Yeah, and like that becomes like his interest in this is he he rediscovers the Punnett square. That was basically like this thing that came up in science and no one cared about it. And then he was like, wait a second, guys, we need to pay attention to Mendel. He was onto something. And because it was Bailey, everyone's like, oh yes, yes, yes. That that is true. And I mean he was right because he was fucking always right. <laughs> but like it just like speaks to like the power that he had. Like that some paper that had been written 30 years ago 
he found it was like, hey, guys, this is a big deal. And everyone's just like, you're right. It is a big deal. We're going to like, we're not going to disagree with you because you're Bailey. Like you, you are God, basically, when it comes to plants. I just pictured your dog. I know, right? Big, <laughs> stupid golden it's retriever. So, yeah, it's just, yeah, we got to give him two initials to make him sound important because otherwise yeah. we're just going to think of your pup. Yeah, with who never gets the one brain cell that all the goldens share. No, which is so sad. Very, very slow dog. So lovable yeah. though. Best. <laughs> now, despite being involved in all these different things and all these different stages of progression, the next spring he actually left Michigan. He was offered a position of director at the Agricultural Experimental Station at Cornell University. While the promotion was a draw, the actual reason that he wanted to accept the position was that Cornell offered to send Bailey to Europe to study their horticulture research and uh, administration. So, you know, he was just like, I can't turn down this opportunity. And um, you know you're a big fucking deal when you tell the school that you work for that you're leaving and the president of the school responds that, you must go, and I quote, you can do more for the advancement of the Michigan Agricultural College leaving than what you would do if you stayed here. Yeah, so the school knew he, he was his reputation and his uh, achievements were going to be too big for what they could, you know, ca- not capitalize on, but but use as as yeah. the school. So they were they holding were like, him back. Right, and, and it sounds like the president was saying like, even if you leave and go on to do great things, people know that you came here and that's good enough for us, which, which means you're probably pretty balling. Yeah. Imagine telling the company you're leaving and they're like, hell yeah. Like the work you'll do without us is going to be so important. And that's going to make us better. Even if you're not here. Yeah. Like that's just, it's it, like I said, it almost sounds like a joke when you describe the way his life goes. Um, now, that, took that is job. what my boss at Olive Garden said. <laughs> he said, when you're gone, we'll all be better off. <laughs> so I, uh, I guess when you're here, I'm just, you're family, like, so guess I'm just the, like Bailey. You're mm-hmm. just basically uh, in an Italian family. Welcome. We're better off if you leave. So he took the job at Cornell, and the first thing he did was leave. He started in Ireland, where when he was there, he decided to... Um, that the term sod crop was a bad one. We should use the term cover crop, which everyone knows now. You know, just a casual flyover linguistic change. Part of why he they cared about what he said, though, is because he we we didn't even cover it because we don't have time. We're forty five minutes into this episode, and we've Jesus we haven't even gotten into like any of the big stuff. But he was considered the America's foremost expert on the Carex genus. And that's something he just somehow managed to do in between all of the stuff we've been talking about. For our listeners, that's Sedges. Th- this sounds all made up. It sounds all fake. He's not even 30 yet. And he's got total command over an entire field and has pretty good command and several others. N- nobody nobody has told him that he's too young to be doing this. And oh, I wish. What an amazing idea. <laughs> it's it's time for the 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 old people to, to stay in charge with the, with the sod crops shaking their, <laughs> their Irish hands with yeah. their bottle of whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> Can't go around changing stuff. I can say that I married an Irish person. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> He's got command over so many fields. You might as well call him a farmer. Oh, ah. bars. He's spitting. Dom, please cut out the stuttering before I delivered that line. <laughs> Actually, can you play it and then like have a rewind sound and then have him say it again? Because that'd be fucking great. He's got command over so many fields, you might as well call him a farmer. Now, to your point, he was like unreal. Uh, now, while overseas, he not after he changed the word sod crop to cover crop, he went on to utilize cameras, taking pictures of plant specimens, and in this process, developed the photographic procedure for documenting plants that would become the standard in botany. That old thing. That old thing. He traveled across Europe, connected with the world's experts on a variety of species. And when he came home, he was just like excited to do some sweet research. I mean, that's a hell of a productive vacation. <laughs> Imagine coming back like at this time 
and like so it's not like you're like getting messages like daily or anything and you're like oh how's your vacation by the way we heard that we don't use the term sod crop anymore <laughs> <laughs> saying we don't <laughs> sod crop sounds like a really good insult <laughs> Fucking sod crop. You you planted onions and all you got was a sod crop. Oh, is that calling somebody a shitty farmer? That's yeah, that's pretty insulting back in the day. I'm guessing. Yes. Yeah, so, so he returned back to Cornell, and um, his first interest was into electro horticulture. This was inspired by the extensive greenhouses that he had seen across Northern Europe. Oh man, you you got me going for a second there. I thought you were going to talk about the like putting copper rods in the ground like with your pea plants mm, yeah the more copper the more grow we are going to have to talk about that because i saw a couple of videos of that and i thought it was uh spoof and then i found <laughs> out that it was real and oh we, no we they are we very serious we haven't about talked it. about that so i would like to talk about that off air because i'm gonna make fun of people you should now what he was doing was quite literally using electricity to grow plants with light bulbs while greenhouses were used he was interested in studying the impacts of electrical lighting on plant growth because electricity was new and uh, was basically unexplored. Now, being Bailey, he didn't just do this. He was working on cucumber hybridizing, and um, the failures that he had to produce better crops helped us have a better understanding of hybridizing today and um, a better respect for the work of indigenous people that were put that had put a lot of generations into the efforts of like domesticating pumpkins and gourds and all that kind of stuff. Again, hybridizing was considered like this lowly work by academics, but Bailey was like, I don't give a shit. I'm Liberty Hyde Bailey. Fuck off. He worked tirelessly and continued to like work on these like domesticated backyard crops, as well as like working on selling the good word of native plants for ornamentals and his various sex experiments he basically like was allowed to do whatever the hell he wanted at cornell now in 1890 a whopping like 30 years old or so he wrote about how he felt all these disparate interests were kind of coalescing into like one narrative he says that i have my plans of life work firmly and fully set a large work which has floated as a phantom before my mind for years is now assuming shape and i hope to see it done in a couple of years it is a work, a philosophical work, upon the variation of plants under culture. I'm getting a number of minor works off my hands to leave me freer for this. Rule book is done and annals is launched. I have misses for a companion to the weeks. Two other small books are well underway, and I shall get them off within a year if all goes well. Then I have the most interesting and extensive series of experiments on plant variation ever planned in this country. These demand constant attention. Besides, I'm making comprehensive study and herbarium of cultivated plants. So he wanted to basically turn all of the work he was doing into one compendium for farmers and re researchers to have access to? Yeah, basically. His idea was like, we need to categorize and make all of these things related to one another so we can fully comprehend the diversity of botany and its relationships to domesticated crops and how domesticated crops can help us understand non-domesticated crops. Listen, that's some elevated thinking. I'm starting to think this guy had the best stickiest of the icky the 1800s had ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> he might have. This, this sounds like some real stoner shit. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I'm high right now, and I that sounds awesome. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Matt's like, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm saying this guy was this, like, amazing plant specialist you're telling me he wasn't growing the like the dankest highest yeah. hydro you <laughs> ever put your lips on oh my god colas, there needs four arm size colas dude he's just popping them off <laughs> there needs to be a bailey strain like we have to we have to breed one in honor of him mm -hmm. if it because i don't think it exists so we're Smoking gonna have to step it up and yeah lhb pack <laughs> that shit's yes. hit it hits <laughs> So yeah, like he, he had this idea of like tying all these pieces together, creating a, a comprehensive catalog of resources for farmers and scientists as like this end all be all to build from. I mean, one might say he wanted an almanac. You know, one might. And uh, at this point, the horticultural grounds were being developed. Uh, he had several greenhouses and he had taken over 15 acres of the land at Cornell. 
he included in this fruit trees, nut trees, bushes, wild fruits that had yet to be improved, things like June berries and American plums, native roses, and of course, you know, his annual vegetable crops. The collection was meant to expand to include every domesticated plant across the globe. And today that collection is known as the Bailey Ordorium. And there's over 880,000 specimens there. Okay, so imagine creating the biggest collection of domesticated plants across the globe as like a side hustle and leaving cannabis out. Like, there's just no way. Oh, I, I am sure there must have been some weed in his life somewhere. I, I think the bumper sticker for this episode is, I want what L.H. Bailey was smoking. Yep. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Done. Now, we've covered a lot. And this episode for a part one is very long, and he's still wicked young and hasn't even really hit his prime yet in terms of successes. It's just a warm up. Despite (laughs) all of this, we're still speaking in broad strokes because there's no other way to do this without making an entire season of just Liberty Hyde Bailey. Okay, this is the Liberty Hyde Bailey almanac. <laughs> like, I'm I'm not fully convinced this man ever slept or saw his wife or had time to make the kids that he had. Like, I kind of wonder if he maybe outsourced that. Oh, nah, man, you, you get any memoirs from them, but just like he was the greatest dad ever. He's always uh, around. He did everything. He's great. Yeah. He did not miss. <laughs> Probably. Bailey's interest in publishing and making information accessible also pushed his interest to develop a singular publisher that was responsible for distributing new research to farmers of all types across the country. And this led to him being involved with the development of what was called the Garden Publishing Company. Bailey had this concept of what he called a rural library, which he explained as, in quote, a series of monthly issues of popular pamphlets on scientific and practical topics in agriculture and horticulture, end quote. This concept, this this idea of like quarterly pamphlets from scientists to farmers and back and forth would end up, as we're going to talk about later on, become this really common theme in the permanent agriculture movement, which was really picked up the most by the Friends of the Land uh, with the Land Quarterly magazine, which was developed by Russell Lord, who, as I said, went to a high school that was designed by Bailey. So like, you can see all of this ties together. Even when Lord was putting out this magazine in the 50s, What's interesting is that Bailey was still alive and he was still putting out content. And that's 60 years after what we're talking about right now. So he wasn't even one of these like tragic guys that like did a bunch of stuff and then died young. He, he lived oh, no. he, like 90s. Yeah. The man was unstoppable. Because yeah, he ate his vegetables, obviously. He had sure. the, the best vegetables, all those native plums, like just unstoppable. Antioxidants, man. <laughs> Cancer saw him and was like, you know what? Humans need this. We're going to go. Give him, we'll give him this win. Yeah. Now, functionally, what Bailey wanted to do was publish a series of manuals. So like starting in like 19, 1898, he released The Pruning Book, 1891, The Nursery Book, and 1897, The Forcing Book. And that all sounds, these out. Al- that sounds rough, man. <laughs> the Forcing Book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds rough. It's a very dated term, we'll say that. All these kind of outline the fundamentals of their specialization and was based on the most recent research and had like very extensive and simple diagrams for farmers to follow to be able to apply what these books had in them. Now, for context, we just covered pecans like six weeks ago and we talked about grafting. So like a lot of these techniques were still new and... um this all ended up coming together as part of this like major project. In his annual publication, The Annals of Horticulture, which I, I mentioned in that quote from him, Bailey focused the 1891 issue in particular on just native North American plants and their horticultural varieties. And this was the first attempt in American history to catalog native plants and their uses in history. I can't believe like no one had tried to do that before. I mean, I feel like... People probably tried, but they were like, this is the complete list. It's never going to be more complete than this. And really, it was just 17 plants. And they're like, look out. Most know of what them I mean? were corn. Yeah. Right. So I don't, it's hard to say that nobody ever tried, but it sounds like the comprehensive part is the mm-hmm. key word there. They didn't have the powerhouse of Bailey behind them. No, right. they did not. His interest in cataloging the domesticated varieties weren't because of an interest in saving them. 
in many ways it was actually kind of the opposite. He he really understood and advocated that like varieties of plants would disappear as they became ill adapted to various conditions, but that they uh also would, in his words, be in quote, supplanted by better varieties or those which more completely fill the present demands or fashions. The disappearances are therefore so many milestones to our progress, end quote, which again, god damn it, this is like would be considered a cutting edge, like visionary comment today with all the issues we have with like heirloom plants. Like if somebody was like, no, heirlooms need to die because new generations will step in as things like bugs and diseases and pathogens start to make it impossible to grow some of these heirloom varieties, right? That's like wildly visionary. And he was saying this 100 years ago, 130 years ago. And like it, it spoke to like to Bailey that the this idea of like the fluidity of change was uh, kind of the center of a lot of his work, that the idea of like making plants be static would eventually kill those plants like it the, nature evolves and these plants need to evolve with it but he did find that this framework for crops was really useful for understanding how native plants could meet our needs and that native plants also showed better resilience and often pointed to how cultivation of many plants failed until they were hybridized with natives so like for example he liked to talk about like raspberries that the the native raspberries or the native hybrids often outlived the non-native raspberries and that this pointed to the importance of understanding the value of native plants for long-term planning. And this would really just be like the tip of the iceberg for his development and influence on like ecology and agriculture and what would eventually become agroecology. So how old is he at this point? He's like 32? He's like a, a 36, 38 years old. But yeah, he's, he's in his 30s. Still, just... My, I feel like Liberty Hyde Bailey was the first guy to come up with a resume, and after that, employers just started looking for him, and they've just been steadily disappointed. It made us look bad. Yeah, not mm -hmm. not good. Yeah, that, I mean that must have hurt pretty bad for you guys. I've got like fifteen years before I can feel shitty for accomplishing nothing. Well, enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll still be here. <laughs> I think it's a good spot to end the episode. We're going to try to get through the second half of his life in one episode for part two. I'm not confident that's going to happen, but we're going to try. Because in the second half of his life, he does more plant stuff. He does more writing stuff. He gets much more into like education. I'm just going to make up failures. Uh, he didn't know how to use chopsticks. There we go. That's a good one. Done. Lose, can't, loser. Can't disprove that. Loser. Adding to the plus column, I just looked up a picture of him. Damn. See, da dapper it. looking dude. He's not even yeah. ugly. Stud. No, he's uh, he's very handsome. Son of a bitch. I know, I know. That's why the wife stayed with him. Is like, well, he's brilliant and he's good looking. I don't care if he's not here. I just have Great to show hair. people this this grainy picture of him so they know. Full head of hair. Look at him. Oh yeah. Oh, full head of hair until like. I mean, I'm looking at photos that must be near the end, and he still had. He like right. was not. Bald. Listen, I've had enough of this guy. All right, making <laughs> me feel bad. I'm going to see if I can put a uh, photo in the chat. Oh, he's dapper. Yeah. You know, so... There's a good mustache. Hey, listeners, look that up. What, no My other ride is Liberty Hyde Bailey. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's just, one. he looks like the exact rock star that he is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, if your basis looks like this, you're about to die in the pit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Um, this <laughs> this is a real weird episode. Uh, part two is going to be even weirder. You're going to feel real bad about yourself. But I had a lot of fun. And um, if you just cannot wait for part two, it is up on Patreon right now. Go get it. But I say Patreon, Patreon. If you want to read about him, we also have a full long ass piece on him on our Substack. Which, if you're a Patreon, you can get the the piece goes out once this part two episode drops. All of our Substack pieces come out when the episode is completed that it's on. So if you want to read it, go check it out there. If you want to read it early, same as Patreon, go subscribe on Patreon or Substack and uh, you can get access to it. So until then, see you guys next week. Later. Bye. Bye.